Hi, everybody. My name is Eric Hines. I'm curator of Film at Museum of the Moving Image. I want to welcome you to this week's Reverse Shot Happy Hour. It's the Reverse Shot Happy Hour of Wednesday, October 14th. Uh, and uh, thanks for joining us live. If you're joining us um, on recording via YouTube, thanks for catching up to us. Uh, this will be the second uh, straight broadcast uh, uh, Halloween themed, um, a special time uh, for uh, Americans, for those who are, uh, you know, predisposed to um, the culture uh, around Halloween for reverse shot in particular. There's always been really good writing around Halloween uh, every year. Uh, in fact, there's been an ongoing essay series um, that probably our, our hosts can can mention. Uh, in, in since uh, since really the beginning of the reverse shots days back in the mid aughts, um, and uh, we'll be doing uh, thematic programming here at Reverse Shot Happy Hour throughout this month. Um, so thanks for joining us. Uh, and uh, there we go. A few great pumpkins, uh, as uh, Jeff Reichert's already put into the chat room. Um, anyway, a lot of great essays over the years that have been uh, put in uh, to Reverse Shot via that theme. Uh, Anyway, just want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, want to, hopefully you're spellbound by Nina Simone. Um, if you're not always spellbound by Nina Simone, uh, want to just put a quick note about the museum, uh, our our drive-in, the Queen's Drive-in, uh, our collaboration with uh, Rooftop Films and New York Hall of Science, located at the New York Hall of Science, is ongoing. We'll be going through at least November, perhaps beyond. Um, and also want to just put a note out there that we started a Kickstarter last week um, to uh, help ourselves keep ourselves going during this time where we're still not back in the building. So please uh, visit that if you have um, some money to help uh, keep us going and keep programs like this one uh, uh, going for the foreseeable future. I'll put a link to that into the chat as well. Um, without further ado, I'd rather bring on the more compelling and attractive uh, trio, the hosts of Reverse Shot uh, Happy Hour. Um, editors and founders Michael Koreski and Jeff Reichert, and longtime contributor and filmmaker Free Hasamon. Hey, Eric. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for the intro as always. Hi, Faria. Hello. <laughs> Apologies for the delay, everyone. We were calling to the four corners. <laughs> and now we have four corners, but now we're going to have three in a second. Don't worry, it's a, it's a rotating cast of characters. I don't know that we're better, better or better looking, but Jeff is better lit, perhaps, than any of us. Yeah, I was working on this. I did a test run last week, and I felt it was too bright, and so I've, I've brought things down a notch, and this is, this is kind of where I want to be on all future Zoom calls, reverse shot or otherwise. Yeah, this is not just a Halloween or a seasonal thing. This is a lifestyle for Jeff, and we ask that you respect and accept his lifestyle. And I'm, and I'm feeling kind of underdressed and like overlit for, the, for this particular session. I, 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 when I wore the shirt today, I thought, ooh, autumnal, but I guess that doesn't really cut the mustard. I think that it's great to have different interpretations on a theme, especially when uh, we all, almost without discussion, basically agreed to all theme programming all through the month of October. I mean, who's going to complain about that? Well, I also feel like what, like watching movies, reading spooky stories, like setting the mood is not just um, like a sideline to the day of or costume wearing. It's like engaging in this kind of atmosphere and leaning into this atmosphere that I really appreciate. And especially now, I'm not going to use the exact words in these times, but um, when we've lost some of the more social aspect, which was not a, a great draw for, for many anyway. <laughs> like maybe you don't love the, the performative parts of Halloween. Um, but without that as an option, um, I feel like I've leaned so much harder and sooner into the Halloween spirit and that like thinking about different kinds of spooky movies or sort of occult movies um, has helped me feel less dissociated from time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It places us in the year in a certain way. I'm like, I mean, what are, you know, there aren't a lot of great September movies in a certain sense. Like, what do you watch in September or August? But uh, October, Halloween movies all month. September's for back to school movies. Thank you. Or Thank like you. coming of age. But it doesn't have the same tie. It's not like deep in your circadian rhythm. It's just sort of a learned habit. September is um, more about the kind of slow general decay of things. But then October, you can inject some life back into that decay and make it make you know make death fun. It's Halloween. Yeah, make death fun again. <laughs> <laughs> Michael slogan. 
I've, I've uh, started reading the Edith Wharton ghost stories for the first what? time. But, oh my God, I'm, me too, as of last night, Freeha. Ooh, spooky. <laughs> what, what are you reading right now? Which story? Oh, um, I can't remember. Mine's called The Triumph of Night, and I'm going crazy over it. I love it so much. I love that title. And to be honest with you, the reason why I can't remember is because I read them before bed, and I kind of fell asleep, so I'm not exactly sure where I was at, but I did fall asleep in the book on my chest. Oh, this is really funny. We did not, <laughs> we did not plan this, everybody. Also, one of my favorite um, walking spaces, because that's now all of our new number one hobbies until the weather gets cold, is Greenwood Cemetery for people who live in Brooklyn. It's kind of far for me to get to. It's even a 45 minute walk to get to and it's still worth it because I think about this time when this period of, um, I guess like garden design when a cemetery was considered a public space and people just had a more um, comfortable or like day-to-day -day relationship with, with death and mortality, even, even Americans. Yeah, I mean, that's also just been one of the um, really meditative spots in Brooklyn over the past few months. I know a lot of people who have just been going there to kind of get away and get space and be outside. And it's yeah. really great to have that as a resource. Well, I'm really excited about this week's topic. And again, we've all dressed <laughs> for the occasion. I put on my witchy lipstick. Almost. Um, Hey, witches can, can look like anyone else, man. They don't always put on a show. The theme is witches. And we have two guests today that I think um, uh, are great for the, the multiple ways in which this role is depicted in film. Obviously, there's your run-of-the-mill cartoon, green, <laughs> wart-nosed, pointy hat witch. Um, we also know that it's a way for people to play with female roles and kind of give women a kind of independence or um, power that uh, particularly for some of the time periods that we're looking at, it was harder to do that. Even if you're casting it as the villain, at least that woman was sort of given this agency. And I think that's why um, I know uh, growing up and particularly in the 90s, which I do think was a kind of witchy time, <laughs> um, or at least like a resurgence of appreciation for this role and genre and, you know, like Lilith Fair was happening and stuff, um, mm -hmm. that, uh, it, that, that character always, those characters resonated for me, even when it was flawed or I thought the film could do a better job. There was something that's so appealing and attractive about like, I choose to live life in this other way. I'm, I'm finding power and forging my own path. Um, and I think we have, again, just uh, guests who can speak to that with their lives and work and appreciation for the subject. Um, are you ready? Are you guys ready? Okay, so yeah. I think um, we'll just start, uh, with an introduction with Lauren Domino, who is a wonderful human and producer, writer, filmmaker. Um, she has a work coming up soon, uh, which is a film she co-produced with Kellen Quinn called Time. It's incredible. It will be available on Amazon streaming, uh, directed by Garrett Bradley. Um, Lauren, will you please join us? Will you join our circle? Conjure her. I call the corners <laughs> of the South. <laughs> Hi you're guys. Like, you're like it Hi. depends on where I'm at in the cute in the quad. <laughs> of Zoom. Well, I also just want to say thank you so much. It's the highest compliment that when you thought of witches, you thought of me. <laughs> oh yeah, and everybody. So I'm honored. Is like yeah, she'd be great. Yeah. Um. Thanks. I'm excited to be here. Um. Well, before we call up um, Violet, I was wondering if you could just. Tell us a little bit about um, this amazing film that's coming out on Friday, um, which I think is very anticipated. Oh, that's so sweet. Um, so Time is directed by Garrett Bradley. It's on Amazon Prime this Friday, and it is a love story in the face of mass incarceration. And I will, I don't want to say too much. I think it's like an experience and a ride for people to watch on their own. So watch it and it's in theaters. If you're going to theaters, if the theater is open near you, you can do that too if that's your jam. It's a brilliant yeah. movie. Congratulations. Really. Thank you. And I agree. It's best, best to leave it at that. It was so, there were so many ways in which it's surprising and, and incredibly emotional and loving and 
yeah, I, I don't know that I've seen a film like it. So I think everyone should, should watch. Um, I'd like to bring on the last member of our coven today, Violet Luca, who is a film critic and producer. You'll know her from many popular podcasts about film, which we've had the pleasure of being on with her at various times. Um, and uh, she's a longtime Reverse Shock contributor. Violet, up here. <laughs> Oh, hey, I'm sorry. Sorry, I was in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I'm a corny witch, so I like that somebody brought something stabby to this conversation. <laughs> was, were you cutting a puppy dog tail? Oh, no, no, no. I was just trying to get my uh, cuadrito uh, manso open uh, so I could make that's her how witch, oh, That's how that witches fine. do I'll, it. I'll do it later, later. <laughs> Violet, how are you doing? I'm good. Despite, despite everything, I'm all right. Do you, ha do you have um, at home October and Halloween time rituals to get you in the mood? Uh, in the sense that I wake up too early on a Saturday morning and I'm like, I should just rewatch Scanners. <laughs> then yes. <laughs> Something within me just says it's now. It's the time is now. Yes. Lauren, there's, also, there's also been that great Criterion channel like series that i've been just loving every second of so oh, for 70s horror the 70s horror series yeah yeah some of those films might come up today in conversation oh, it's yeah. great so many good stuff lauren have you been watching anything to get you in the halloween spirit no i actually forgot it was halloween until you asked me to do this <laughs> <laughs> it's okay sometimes you need to be rekindled <laughs> <laughs> my like what, are you like busy like, or something <laughs> yeah and the concept of like a calendar now is just like what you know um but at the start of corona my friends and i started a corona coven where we watched a witch movie each week um Ooh. and now we're gonna bring it back because it's october and it feels okay. seasonal um but yeah i don't really like horror movies but i like witch movies so i feel like my I can only contribute in this conversation for like, which movies about kids or for teenagers? <laughs> <laughs> well, and can you, can you talk about why like your, like what is it about the witch figure or those films that helps surmount your general dislike of horror, even if it is on the softer side of horror? Yeah, well, I like movies about, like, badass women, right? And most witch movies are just that, even though they're painted as the villains, they're really the heroes. Um, or just dealing with, like, complicated interpersonal dynamics. It's really interesting to, like, I rewatched The Craft recently, mm -hmm. and it's wild that you're like, oh, wait, these women are vilified, but through like the male lens that wrote and directed this, but really the, they're just teenagers, right? There's nothing bad or wicked about what they're doing, right? Um, it's like anytime a woman is curious or has agency, she's a witch. Yes, that is. And I like those women. So it's all like all cultures, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's such a classic. It's like externalizing. Of course, it seems evil or bad if you externalize this like storm of emotion that happens in teenage stories. And that's why I think that intersection of like witch or like supernatural and like coming of age, like Carrie gets this bad rap when really it's like, well, you don't know what they're dealing with. Yeah. Like, and it's just like anytime a woman is connected with her own personal power or like universal power and can make things happen, men are afraid. So then she's deemed like a witch, right? And you're like, that's just your own insecurity. Like, so you look at these films and you're just like, oh no, this is a woman that's just totally in touch with herself. Like she can call upon the powers of the elements, right? Like that's just being like centered and in control. But it's like, you know, I don't know. It's it's fascinating to watch a witch movie versus like an action movie and you're like these guys are villains they're horrible they're killing people and like witch movies they're just trying to make something happen for themselves like you know <laughs> and it's amazing how that reads like it com it comes across you know there there are not a small number of women in the world <laughs> i know i have only a, a very tiny sample size but i feel like it's a sort of widespread phenomenon that women will watch these films and uh, or non-men will watch these films and um, respond to that character 
even the, like no regardless of how they're being depicted regardless of how in the craft like you know if Iriza Balk is supposed to be is just such a monster but I'm like she's amazing I want to be Firuza Balk yeah did the craft have a strong influence on you too Violet oh absolutely I mean I remember watching that movie in high school uh watched it many a time since um yeah, I mean, I think I would actually argue that the director is trying to make it seem like these women are unreasonable, that these girls specifically are unreasonable because they, you know, they just let this power go to their heads. But of course, that's great. Like, fuck that guy, push him out the window. That rules. <laughs> it's like we all want to see what they do. We would all do what they would do, right? So yeah, it's, it's, it's like, that's always the thing with the witch, right? Where it's this transgressive power that outsizes women's role perhaps in, you know, a patriarchal society. But then of course, like, who, good, good. <laughs> well, and it also Art. makes me think about the, the aesthetics of witch portrayal and how there's a very classic, like good witch, blonde, bad witch, brunette, you know, like who, who's the person that we're supposed to see as our hero and carries the story forward. Wizard um, of Oz, of course. Very, yeah, like goes back to Wizard of Oz and, and maybe something more well, primal if we're talking about white supremacy, but. <laughs> yeah, well, totally. Cause there's that nature of like good magic, magic for the light and magic for the dark, which already is like super charged, mm -hmm. right? And you're like, but at the end of the day, it's both mad, it's all magic, right? Like, so if you're gonna vilify one, you're gonna vilify the other. Um, so it's totally tied to like white supremacy. Everything's tied to white supremacy that's wrong with the world. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, there's actually a lot of modern witches encourage, you know, an engagement with the shadow self, as it is called, like the dark, sort of the dark side, because it is, it's about the same idea of balance and stuff like that. But of course, you know, uh, when it's, it's Salem, and uh, some cows are getting sick, you don't know why. I'm gonna blame this uh, old lady. You know, she's ugly, she's useless, she's outlived her welcome. Perhaps she uh, used to be a midwife and she knows like medicinal herbs that not only <laughs> induce an abortion, but maybe relieve symptoms of, uh, you know, PMS and like women have to suffer, right? Because the Eve ate the apple. This is destroying the natural order. Right. So there's like, there are like so many layers of like, racism and misogyny and all this stuff kind of bound up in representation of witches but again it's like it's fun it's subverse it's like very subversive and very fun like the witches that movie how that is just so subversive and fun mm -hmm. can we talk about it and actually it's interesting it's interesting because both the craft and witches are having um reboots right yeah yes oh, they're rebooting yeah. Reboots is the wrong word. Um, there Re will be um, a contemporary version. They're established IP. They're sure yeah. back. They're gonna win at the box office. Get them out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just the right moment where the kids who grew up with them are now the parents, so they can mm -hmm. bring their kids to the movies. Yep. But I think, like to your point, Violet, like the 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 depictions of of witchery, witchcraft that are most interesting are actually a combination of dark and light and like this even as a child like the thing that you respond to is being told like in the dark crystal that like every human is a combination of these things that are like hidden in surface and you know you you have to you have to let, let death is part of life and um and i think that this like strain of of films in the 70s um felt like one of the like a like a a most consistent time in order to engage with that aspect of it and which is is a film that is for children and it still completely like treads the line of like she's bad but you want to be her but she you know like she's self-actualized and it's angelica houston how yeah. can you not yeah <laughs> i was obsessed she's with that book as a kid the Ro is roald doll yeah me roald too book. and the movie makes her much more glamorous and fascinating than the book yes so I just read the book for the first time oh. a few months ago because I was obsessed with the movie as a kid, but just didn't read the book because that's just who I am. Um, and the book ends so much darker than the movie, but is far more interesting. Yes, no. And it's like not, I don't want to spoiler it 
it was written just a like, long time ago. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, if something was written in the 70s, it's okay to have a spoiler. But like in the book, they don't like, they best her, but he stays a mouse. Yeah. That's and it's the whole now. point is like, he's going to die if his grandma, because his grandma's old. Like the lifespan of a mouse is like four years and that's how much long she has left. And it's like really beautiful lesson about like the nature of life, you know? and to be born and like reborn or however you want to look at it and the movie really simplifies it so that like they prevail and that's the end and everyone's happy and I think going back to like shadow light dark you know just the full encompassing of a life of existence it's more in the book um than in the movie and the idea of um like consequences that have no return is, su- is something that's such a real lesson for children and adults. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's like you look at it and you're like, oh, the witches are evil, but those kids were nosy. Like, <laughs> they can just let them have their thing, you know? You know, Rodal famously hated children. So, of course, he's going to be able to sort of draw out their worst qualities for this uh, story for them. <laughs> But it's interesting, well, on the Roald Dahl kick, it's, like, interesting because then you have Matilda, right, who is not classified as a witch, but has magical powers, does very <laughs> witchy things, right? Um, she's, like, a young Carrie, but with salamanders, right? Like, but, more fun. but she's seen as just being, like, good as well, opposed to, like, the witches. Terrible. Yeah. Family, she's, like, the exception. She's this uh, freak of nature, but in a great way, and that, of course, you're going to be rooting for her when she spins the carrot around and shoots it at somebody. And a freak of nature because she has, like, intellectual curiosity. That's what I love about yeah. Mitzel, another book that I adored when I was a kid, years before that the movie came out. And I do, I, I do like the movie, but, Lauren, when you mentioned that as a, as a potential witch movie, you get, like, I just lit up. I got so excited at the, the idea, because she really is a tyke version of Carrie because she's she, the idea is she's telekinetic and she's using the full mm-hmm. extent of her intellectual powers which become externalized as telekinesis and I think that like Matilda is like such a great example of um of a good witch with with, with not even really a complication obviously Carrie is complicated she murders her entire high school senior class yeah. she's seen by future generations as a murderer and a monster Matilda is just gonna be a favor all right but like if Matilda didn't meet Miss Honey, that might have been like her trajectory. Mm-hmm. It's true. Yeah, who knows? So then that is that is the complication that like without support of your power as a young woman, where does that power go? And how, what are you supposed to do with your like oppressed and frustrated energy? Matilda's it's way Carrie deeper than you thought. <laughs> You guys, Carrie had <gasps> Carrie had Miss had the gym teacher played by Betty Buckley. Carrie had a Miss Honey, and then fate swooped in and took her away from her. And but she, she came to Carrie too late. She came too late. Also, well, I never I, felt bad for those other people in the town, even the one that was on the fence. Either. <laughs> I was just thinking, going back to something Violet was talking about, just in terms of like going back to actual Salem and the mm-hmm. sort of origins of American pur- puritanical, paranoid versions of witches. Like I grew up really kind of obsessed with the Crucible, actually, because we we read it in high school. I don't, I'm not entirely sure that it should be something that's just taught as a matter of course in high schools. But anyway, we read the play, and then the movie version with Winona Ryder and Daniel Day-Lewis came out while, basic, while I was in high school. So it became this thing. I saw it like three times in the theater. But I was always so troubled by it. And I think it's such a troubling text. I think Arthur Miller obviously had a lot of issues with women in, in his writing. Mm-hmm. But there's something so weird about The Crucible because if it's like it has like a general hypocritical kind of baseline to its narrative, which is that Yes, it's obviously using the Salem witch trials and the hysteria around that as a critique of American Puritanism and and just, you know, our basic um, uh, inability to see anything past ourselves and religious fundamentalism. But then to get at that idea and to decry this idea of calling people witches, he actually creates his own witch character, which is Abigail, right? So the whole thing is predicated on this young 
woman coming of sexual age and being really confused and then accusing everyone else of being a witch and she has to be somewhat vanquished herself so it's like he couldn't tell the witch story without creating his own witch and it feels like that's per perpetuated in a lot of american uh witch stories like you still have to have the villainous witch no matter what and that they're relegated to not even like okay fine let's say we centralize a villainous witch character that's one thing but they don't even get to be the hero of the story like in the sale in the 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 book and the adaptation on the arthur miller book it's john proctor i guess it's, it's like all mm -hmm. about how he's so put upon and the the it's about his trial and you know him being put on trial and his relationship with his wife it's not even about the people who are creating this kind of phenomenon in their community right i mean it feels important to note that in america witches were the original anti-christian figures and of course now with QAnon and uh the original satanic panic let's say so this is yeah. an idea that comes yeah. back return of the repressed blah 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 but um yeah it's uh yeah it's um the the you know, adolescence is always a, is a common place for witches to start from or to return or want to return by sucking the life out of children. Like mm -hmm. there is so much like fear and sexuality bound up in every rep representation that, uh, and then of course, even like a crone, it's like, well, she can't have children. She's too old. She can't have children. She doesn't have a husband. What is her worth? <laughs> what so, what yeah. else is she going to do with her right, life now right. that she's all croning out? Yeah. Yeah, gross. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's all this stuff tied up. It's also interesting when you mention the Crucible, because I think of like the character of Ketuba, who's like the slave. Mm -hmm. And she's the original one who's like, she's teaching them witchcraft, which is just like, totally, again, satanic panic, thinking of like African spiritual religion, right? right? Anything that was not Christianity was automatically deemed being a witch. So any sort of like healing powers of like, knowing medicine, knowing the land, knowing other traditions was automatically deemed witchcraft, which is like, to me, it's not. It's just like a religious practice, right? Um, so it's really interesting. We're going through our list, like some things people know, like Eve's Bayou or the idea of like, you know, I'm from New Orleans and like voodoo is huge, but I wouldn't necessarily classify them as witches. Mm -hmm. right um but it's like any woman that has access to magic lives under the umbrella of witch in our society and I think that that is like really limiting and I, I know that for me part of bringing up some of those films I mean first of all it is an interesting question like well wh what is this are there even if it's not a, a witch film are there characters that have sort of witchy attributes that we can look to um, but I also found myself coming up, up against, you know, in making, generating my list, coming up against this issue where I was like, I guess most people's idea of like what a witch looks like is a white woman. And a lot of the counter examples that I found, it was like, it was almost as though in order to present, say, a black woman as a witch in a, in a film, there needed to be this whole other backstory that, that could, and again, some of those stories are cool and great. I love Angel Heart, but it, like it shouldn't have to require a connection to voodoo culture and African, you know, whatever the, in whatever very broad way of speaking to that is, but like African diasporic spiritual uh, connections. Um, I want other categories for people who are not white witches. Yeah. Yeah. Because so much of that, you know, the syncretic religions of like Latin America, in places like New Orleans, like, that is, again, it's, it's fitting animistic traditions within the, the, you know, sneaking them into these, these Christian sort of archetypes where, Ashum is like the Virgin Mary and that sort of that sort of like the way that that tradition had to be kind of smuggled in to the United States or in other places in the Americas and like the the tragedy of it but yet they persevere they really flourish and even people who are very uh very devout might have a little you know a little talisman in their kitchen they might pour a little 
alcohol outside to keep stuff away or draw things good things near like that yeah. like they they it is it's like i agree there's very little on-screen representation of it but in the real world it's actually much more as you say it's much more complicated and like nice yeah. <laughs> yeah. and and that's another example in which those characters are almost always on the side right that's like, it's yeah. like a side interest i found these, and I would love other examples in films if you guys have. I think Eve's Bayou is a great one, even though it's sort of a smaller moment in the film. But um, most of my examples were in television. And I think it's because you can have a larger cast and like Sabrina gets to be, um, you know, the main, the main chick. And then, she, you know, she has a friend who is a black woman who comes from this particular tradition or thinking about True Blood in which, again, I'm like not complaining about these characters because Lafayette on True Blood is mm -hmm. truly... Yeah, like he's it, but um, again, it's like play, kind of placing that as a lesser practice in even in this like subversive realm. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's like the witch is always othered, even in supernatural realms. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think, yeah, it's just like really interesting. Is is it because the witch's power is often like self generated? Like they have tools that they can use to make power they can make power out of anything right as opposed to like someone with just like a supernatural ability like i don't know i think it's like a, a really werewolf. yeah like a vampire or a werewolf i just think that like the witch uh, the witch's villain is just like suppression right mm -hmm. they want you to suppress the part of yourself that's like other right that's like a little spooky that's into stuff that other people aren't and it's like the quickest insult you can say is like, oh, you're a witch, you know? Um, a movie that I love that I'm sure you guys are fans of good quality cinema, so you probably have not seen it, but I love <laughs> Practical Magic. Oh, I've uh, seen that. Surprisingly <laughs> good. I watched yeah. it recently and was like, oh, why did I re think this was a joke movie? It's a real movie. <laughs> it's a real movie. It's got Stoddard really Channing. <laughs> Great. Always a good it's song. On the soundtrack. But it's like in Practical Magic, they're witches, but her day job is she owns an apothecary. Right? She makes lotions, which are just different spells like that we use in everyday life. And use in our everyday lives, but it's just like the label of being a witch still makes her like other because she's in connection to herself. Why are people so trying afraid to keep us of down? <laughs> I know, like, why are you afraid <laughs> of some natural knowledge about the world? Yeah, yeah, we're not afraid of chemicals that we put in our body on a daily basis, but like, <laughs> let a woman be like, take this arrow root and ashwagandha. It's like, oh no, <laughs> you're trying to curse me. Well, I mean, because the sort of like the the original text that was used in like the witch trials in Europe and in the Americas was this thing called the Malaeus Maleficarum, which was literally commissioned by the Pope. And it's, it's, it's basically a way of explaining witchcraft without saying that witchcraft is like too real and therefore like a violation of God's goodness and power, but that, you know, witches are in communication with nature and know how to like it's an alchemical thing where they can manipulate nature and they can alter it and pervert it in these ways. And so it's like, okay, so you get to have both. You get to have, be able to say, mm -hmm. God is great and all powerful, but then these fucking witches over here, oh my God, get up. Ugh. So um, like, and that was, you know, that was, um, you know, the, the, that was the uh, source for Hoxon, which is the first uh, silent movie, but which is, there's lots of butt kissing in that. <laughs> uh, tell me more. You can't show the them kissing the fronts <laughs> of guys. <laughs> or maybe that was just the way they liked it, you know? No, they, no there's tons <laughs> in the book. There are tons of pictures of witches kissing butts. Like, each other's butts, got, like, <laughs> women's butts. Like, you know, they're, you know, they're getting close to the danger zone. That's, they yeah. must be <laughs> They're free. I mean, they're also, being Corona safe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a, a 
according to the Canadian Health Board or whatever. Right. <laughs> They're like, just stand over. Um, I mean, I also think that in in a, in a lot of these depictions, it's a way of having like to, you get to have your cake and eat it too. If a woman is in this particular role, you can villainize her, but also get to show women doing certain kinds of things that are like titillating or exciting slash seem like they're having the most fun in the film to begin with. Like well, Ursula the Sea Witch is a very iconic example of this where like we're supposed to hate her, but I'm like, everybody else is so insipid in this movie. <laughs> but yeah it's, it's the it's it's getting to do both in the same way that like in the 30s and 40s it was like having a cabaret girl gave you the opportunity to still tell a moralistic tale but um engage with all these things that people want to see in movies well i mean sex sorry go ahead oh, no, you go you go you go okay. i was gonna say sexual like sexual like feminine sexuality that expression of power is socially acceptable and part of the reason why it's socially acceptable is exactly what you're describing. It's like, you get to see it. Like, you get the pleasure of watching uh, some showgirl with uh, great gams and uh, <laughs> okay. dress, you know, kind of go wild. And then, you know, right. you put the lid back on it, right? And so, and so much of, like, which is uh, power, even in these, like, early texts throughout history is, like, this pervert, you know, like, they're too liberated. And they must, the, we've got to put the lid on it. And so it's, um, I don't know, the, 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 the Hayes Code is a nice way of having it both ways too, I would say. Yeah. And I would say like, to that extent in which movies, they're always super hot, right? Like they're babes <laughs> or yeah. they're trying to chase being a babe, right? So it's exactly. like, if you're in Hocus Pocus and you're a Sanderson sister, you're like, I want to be young. And it's really interesting that in a lot of film interpretations of which is it's all chasing this male gaze right mm -hmm. of like I want I want a guy like even in the craft it boils down to the end of their friendship and Nancy going too far because of a man right right so it's still controlled by like this male gaze and like the perception of men and not just like for themselves right like in Hocus Pocus she like wants to make her boyfriend who's been dead forever jealous by being like <laughs> young and it's like anytime a witch is unattractive she's usually teaching a younger witch right who's <laughs> hot and I just want to see more unattractive people using their powers right like outside this gaze I know it's Hollywood but it's like really interesting this is why they're I often very sexualized. I enjoy depictions where somebody is like the old crone figure, but they can temporarily appear young, but it's not because they need that to be, to feel um, va valuable, but because they're like turning like het values on. So it's like going to a like really uncomfortable drag brunch where you're like, I don't, I'm not, this isn't great, but like you're using this person's very limited sense of the world to like question that and pierce that. Right. Yeah. Because you're, you're well, and, oh, go ahead. I was just going to make a dumb reference. You're probably going to say something. No, 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 do, 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 I'm all in favor of it. Give me. So like in Teen Witch, there is an example of like Teen Witch, yes. Zelda, who's like the older witch, teaches like she's, teaching the younger witch, but never at any point, though she has the capability, does she change her own physical form, mm. right? She creates a hot bow from a <laughs> toad, but she stays the same because she's like secure in herself. So I think that that's actually a powerful depiction of a witch, though the movie contains some really bad white rapping. <laughs> that's right, that's right. <laughs> that's it's, it's true that's the that's most the, terrifying thing about that movie that's the yeah. real villain <laughs> true <laughs> michael what were you going to say i was just thinking well this kind of goes back to this idea of the witch as this like super hot dixon type because i was thinking back upon the most influential witch movie of my childhood and that was the witches of eastwick <gasps> and i think it's worth i watched it a lot and i was really i was really um attracted to the three of them in the sense that like I wanted to be part of their like sister group, their sisterhood. I found them to be just like endlessly lovable, fascinating. But when they assume their witchiness, when the narrative really kicks into gear and they become 
they're sort of under the spell of this literal devil figure played by Jack Nicholson. And by the way, this is Michelle Pfeiffer, Susan Sarandon, and Cher. So they are very appealing. Um, but when that when that happens, they get extra hot. They're supposed to be like, kind of like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like regular Massachusetts <laughs> girls. And now they're just like super sexy. They're they're like engaged in a threesome with the devil. They become like the town sluts, like they get spit out at the supermarket. Doing shit with the cherries. Yeah, kind of wearing lingerie. Cherry. I got a fact yeah, check that. About. Te technically, it's a foursome. But it's right. This is true. Not, that's actually it's very like, revealing. Like cut cut out track. Jack Nicholson. <laughs> Who's, and he and he's actually at his least attractive. Like he's, they make him as disgusting huh. as possible, which I, which is also really interesting. But that movie is so. It's based on a John Updike book, and I haven't read the book, so I don't know exactly what the source of the witchcraft of the story is but i'm still i love the ambiguity of it i love the fact that they are they're intent they're they're completely likable they're the heroes of the film but their togetherness and their closeness results in sorcery that they almost can't control so there's even though they're likable the movie has the story has this kind of overlaying of like uh oh feminine power don't let them get yeah. too close they're going to be women just getting popular. together <laughs> but it's also, it also gives them so much agency so you never come away hating that those characters you just think that okay let's just like rein it in a little bit don't give them too much power that's the thing i really like about a film that you mentioned violet uh which is george romero's season of the witch yes. where i feel like he is sort of all about letting this woman who's who's a, she's a she's a battered housewife essentially in the 1970s who attends a tarot reading at her neighbor's house and just sort of like goes over to the dark side and by the end of the film has, you know, it's, it's, it's played a little mysteriously, but she's, she's murdered her husband using her powers. Well, she, she gets to join her local coven, which is great. She gets to have sex with her daughter's hot professor, mm. major upgrade from husband. Oh. So like she, like, he, I mean, Romero, Romero was a very smart guy and he was like, okay, here's an interesting way to explore women's liberation for perhaps a generation that was too old to experience it and to really, you know, be free. Um, and of course she doesn't, she doesn't change anything about herself because she knows, she knows the deal. Yeah, she realizes how, she's allowed to realize how awesome she is over the course of the movie. Exactly. She's not just mom or wife, so. She's a witch. She's a witch. And I was also, I wanted to quickly bring up um, another movie that has not hot witches in it, which is, <laughs> of course, <clears throat> Rosemary's Baby. Uh -huh. Because oh, maybe yeah. to that, she doesn't give a shit. She knows she <laughs> rules, and she does. <laughs> Um, and she, you know, she, she, um, drugs, uh, she drugs young Mia Farrow and, um, they're, they're old and, you know, they're not appealing bodies, but they, you know, they really believe in what they're doing and, um, they get, they get what they want in the end. <laughs> well, are hereditary too, the, the, this like occult group around them. I kind I really like when films do this or kill lists too, where they're like, there's some power in nudity that is that is outside of um our sexual attraction to yeah. that nudity and outside of our rules about what sexual attraction is allowed to be they're like it's not even about that i'm calling to like to to this force with the power of my naked body is like mm -hmm. weirdly terrifying and effective I, speaking and speaking of Rosemary's Baby, I love how the true villain of that movie is, of course, John Cassavetes, um, the worst husband of all. <laughs> yeah. Time. But he's not really one of the witches. He's just this poor sap who let them take advantage of his his um, you know uh, his ego. Yeah. And I I find that because ultimately, the, you know, Ruth Gordon is still pretty funny and likable at the end of that movie. She's perfect as she is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really all about Cassavetes. Just get him out of the picture and she let her join the coven. It seems like a perfectly fine time. Um, last year when we could be with people, I actually wa rewatched Rosemary's Baby with a friend who was eight months pregnant. And I was like, girl, do you want to do that? And she was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so into it. And I was like, that's witchy, awesome. Um, and the, but the thing that struck her and made her uncomfortable or emotional during her pregnancy and watching this film was not the baby or the body horror of carrying demon seed. It was the medical 
uh, rigmarole of like being told over and over by men that her perspective uh, was in, invaluable or not valuable at all. Yeah, Dr. Saperstein famously says to Rosemary, don't read books, Rosemary. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, I think like, yeah. Well, I, I kind of want to talk, go back to the idea of the devil figure, the Satan figure and like the witch's relationship with that figure because sometimes it's great and sometimes, you know, like in Witches of Eastwick, I think it's sort of the, the main failing of the film that they like, Ha still have to tether the idea of power back to this male figure. I think it depends on how conceptual or not Satan is. But I'm curious if you guys have other examples that struck you in these movies. Um, Belladonna of Sadness, where, which is a very beautiful movie, but it's very like trigger warning, be careful movie. Yeah. And I made a film from Japan. Uh, you know, she's basically the local lord invokes prima nocta against her wishes she's raped and um the devil comes to her and is like hey i have a i have a way to make this all better and it's and even that relationship is very like rapey or, you know, like uh -huh. rapey, right where it's like i'm coming for you know like hey why don't we do this why don't you try this and then she does achieve a measure of you know she brings harmony to everybody there and she like I mean, it's it's like this weird forced, um, this forced liberation almost. Uh. And then, but then of course, at the end, it's all, you know, she's burned at the stake. It's all put back in the, you know, her husband is of course useless during this whole thing. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I would say the reason why it jumps to mind is that there's a, one or two sequences where the devil appears to her as just like a little penis guy. <laughs> So it's like, you can't, you can't make that any more explicit. Like right. it's right there. You know exactly what you're getting. And it's like, that's, that's like a, it's more direct than other representations, let's say. <laughs> is there an example where the devil figure or like the person that's pulling the strings is a woman? Well, there is. A I can't think of one right now. That I saw recently, um, it was a Hammer film that was airing on TCM. It, it came to the United States. I think it was called The Devil's the Devil's Own, but it was released in the UK as The Witches. It's like a 1966 film where oh. it is a, it's about the school teacher, it's Joan Fontaine actually in her last role. She's been like traumatized by work in Africa. So there's this sort of like animus element. She's been, she's had a total nervous breakdown. And so she comes from that to a small English village, you know, kind of like very quaint and perfect and finds that there is some witchcraft going on. And, you know, the witchcraft, it turns out, is being sort of steered by Kay Walsh, who is trying to achieve some sort of immortality by sacrificing a young girl. And that was a configuration that I hadn't seen too, too often in witch-related films, because usually it feels like there is some sort of male presence trying to bottle back up this female energy. But here you have, like, Joan Fontaine and Kay Walsh facing off, which was, it's not a great movie, but it's certainly, it's, it's like, different in a way. It had a different energy about it that I liked. Suspiria is also that configuration. However, it is uh, beautiful and so misogynistic. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, yeah. I, was, I was even thinking, and it's more recent and, and so, you know, not necessarily a fair comparison because it's responding to a lot of what we're talking about, but in The Witch, that um, movie that came out a couple of years ago, um, I believe sa like Satan is always in different guises. So he barely appears on screen. It's like Black Phillip. It's a goat figure. It is a male voice, but I didn't feel the presence as strongly. And the sort of the moments of like um, euphoria or even like feeling sexually activated seemed to me to be more amongst other women. Like it was more in the sisterhood realm than I, I'm turned on for this or I've stepped into my power for this male figure. Nick Rapold uh, chimes in in the chat with Bedazzled. Bedazzled. Yes. I can't she, remember. She's Satan. She's, she's not, Satan. She's actually she's just Satan. Satan. She's yeah, Satan. she's there literally no Satan. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> she's a female Satan. <laughs> Which is not necessarily a good thing, but there are no witches. It's, we around. it's weird when that like makes you smile because you're like, at least there's this one <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's different. <All> right. <laughs>
I like that they operate independently, right? Like when the witches don't have to have any kind of like paternalistic figure yeah. to answer to. When they just they're just like doing their thing. Mm -hmm. They have their own I mean that's that's that is often the case, right? I was thinking of this really good movie called Burn Witch Burn from 1962. Has anyone, oh, yeah. has anyone seen that? No. It's excellent. Oh. Is it available um, somewhere? I don't know where it is right now. I saw it on TCM a few years ago. Uh -huh. it's, it's a British horror movie from 62. I think it was um, released in the United States under a different name. It was released in the United States under the title Night of the Eagle. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Oh. Yes. Which, is, yes. Which, which doesn't make any sense until you see the movie. And then you and then there's one scene where you're like, oh, OK. That makes sense. <laughs> but it's just one scene with an eagle. Otherwise, with a really cool special effect involving an eagle, I have to say. But otherwise, the, the plot is really fascinating and, and it predates Rosemary's Baby, which is interesting. Um, it takes place at a college, so it's like, it has that great sort of like academia is. Yeah. It's terrifying. <laughs> it's like one of, one of my favorite things, like academia is a place for demons, is like my, one of my favorite sub, <laughs> sub genres. Um, and there's a professor who starts to suspect that his wife is practicing witchcraft and more to the point he starts to suspect that all of his good luck and all of his promotions in life are because his wife has been casting spells for him which is which brings up a whole all kinds of contradictory amazing things to think about but it's based on a story called conjure wife which is actually a really funny probably better title <laughs> conjure more wife. to the point <laughs> some wife and she conjures um <laughs> but I highly recommend Burn Witch Burn. I wouldn't, and I don't want to ruin it because it has twists and turns, and it's just a great, great central concept. Yes, I love, Fritz Lieber. It's based on the Fritz Lieber story. Uh, I love that idea as an allegory for like the unsung labor of women. Yeah, with front front men, you emotional know, emotional labor. Yeah, yeah, and he's and he's doing <laughs> great. He's just he just gets emotional labor at spells. <laughs> he's just feeling completely like you know. Um, emasculated there's no other reason for him to get mad he's doing great he's just like wait a second i think my wife might be doing this i hope the twist is that like her magic power she just listens she's there for him <laughs> has like great advice and just like a smart lady advice. you know like she she's like makes a really so great better. tea if you have a headache knows what to do about that <laughs> Exactly. And really, she's like, I wish that you had magical powers because my life is miserable. <laughs> What's a movie where the witches are like really grotesque? I feel like we've, uh, out of our own sympathies, maybe focused on those that are more complicated in some way, um, or at least, yeah, we sympathize with them even if they're the villain. But what are witch movies where they're like truly villainous? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to say maybe there are none. Blood, but also they're just telling them what's up. <laughs> so, say that again. A throne of blood. Oh. Which is they had a also Lady Macbeth's. Yeah. Yeah. But also it's sort of like they're just telling them what's up. So. They're just telling them what's up. Come on. Don't judge them. Apparently that's a crime. <laughs> Another member no, of Trump. knowing stuff. Don't tell men that what they're doing <laughs> is a bad idea. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, no. it, it probes the witches, you know, obviously they're gorgeous at first, but they do become more grotesque over the course of the film as we see their true selves. There's one. Yeah. Right. Yes. We talked about that at the beginning in a different context because Angelica Houston is so glam at the beginning, but once the yeah. mask comes off, she's not so glam. Well, I mean, Wizard of Oz. I mean, that's sort of the classic ugly witch. That's true. We, not, and yeah. that has that has good witch, bad witch dichotomy. Yeah, like, but she's also ugly pretty. Like, come on. Oh, yes. I'm, she's like, she's like oh, you yeah. take the nose and the glasses off, and oh my god, she's pretty. Yeah. Like, she's like, <laughs> like, like, like witches of Eastwick are babe. dowdy until like Susan yeah. Sarandon before she takes her glasses off. What a yawn. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have, we have a question from the audience. Could you all put a withdraw your confirmation hex on Amy Coney Barrett? asking for a friend. <laughs> I, I think ending with a spell person. would be interesting, but... I mean, do we want to reveal our powers? I don't think it's safe. If it were to happen, we can you save. guys, like, I think Zoom people already computers know. computers <laughs> may, like, blow up, and I don't want to be responsible for anyone's MacBook day. How about when, I think when we have our toast <laughs> shortly, send your, all of your witchy energy and whatever guise or form you do that, Towards this spell. 
<laughs> or you can cool. send it to my familiar. I, that is also, I accept Venmo and familiar. <laughs> <laughs> and do it stealthily. <laughs> Welcome back, Eric. Thanks, Michael. Do you have a favorite witch in cinema, Eric? Do you hate her, love her, love to hate her, or hate to love her? <laughs> All of the above. There's no good answer. How do I answer? Um, well, I feel like Eric's been doing some like wizardry behind the scenes. He's like there, he disappears, he shows up, you know, or it's called working Zoom, but for the purpose of uh, <laughs> this conversation, you know? Well, I mean, he's a I, wizard. I, I, th I think that uh, the, your, Lauren, your, your read on The Wicked Witch of the West is something that I agree with too. I was, we watched The Wizard of Oz recently and thought how attractive and appealing she is, you know? Um, and when she's introduced as sort of like the, the, the nasty woman down the street and actually just how like much charisma she has on screen and how yeah. sort of powerful she is as a performer. Um, that even when she comes back as this incredibly horrifying presence, which ha truly haunted me as a child. Um, and, you know, um, uh, if another kid on the block would somehow sing the witch song of somebody on a bike, we would all just be stricken with fear. Um, that said, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's like the strongest performance in the film and you can't take your eyes off of her. And she's terrifying and attractive and appealing. And you're right, like she's done up to be as grotesque as possible and yet you kind of can't forget about her, so. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought of something that I wish we would talk about earlier because um, I think the time's almost up. But why, it's so, why, is witch, why are witches gendered, right? You're like, it's so gendered. If you're a witch, you're a woman. If you're a man, you're right. a wizard. Like, and wizards or hold more power <laughs> or a warlock. Like, yeah. that's bullshit. I don't it's... know if we could curse on this. No, <laughs> did it. I did it. <laughs> you're a woman who does what she wants. <laughs> I'm a witch. I think that um, some of the examples that came up don't make as much hay about that. Like, when it's a group situation. <laughs> like, like Hereditary or Rosemary's Baby, where it's like irrelevant, they don't, they don't get labeled, which I find interesting. And I think that's, that's the part, like I think that's more compelling to me than Lone Witch figure for exactly that reason. Like it's about this communal power that I think is, it, it's not by accident that it's in that setting that, that a like less focus, less of a focus on gender occurs. Yeah. I would say um, a, a, a film where the witch is, the the hero of course maleficent which is the upside down version of snow white you know so much of that movie is her embracing her motherly instincts and again having really communing with nature in this really um intense and beautiful way and then um i saw maleficent too and don't do that <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, uh, belladonna of sadness yeah. it's funny that you brought up belladonna but we never talked about though again we're out of time but now that you brought up maleficent i was thinking they're all the disney witches the, the fairy tale witches that we grew yeah. up being terrified of i mean the, the wicked stepmother of cinderella is a form of a witch obviously snow white's aunt <laughs> becomes a very terrifying witch and she's a good example of a completely terrifying witch but she of course, is transformed from the most beautiful queen in the land. So there is always yeah. that dichotomy. She's well, and then in Cinderella and the like fairy godmothers and Sleeping Beauty. But I just I, thought of a the worst witch. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that film. Another mm -hmm. Bruce and Bulk has just really got a monopoly on the trolls. <laughs> but Tim Curry, queer icon in this movie, is yeah. like the grand high. It doesn't get enough love. Or, or Lafayette. I think that sometimes, even though it's gendered when it's at its best, their idea of what that gender can be is more fluid because, again, it's about like subverting status quo. And we did talk about one Disney witch, but it was Ursula <laughs> Sea Witch, oh. which, like, of course, I brought up the one example, which A is like maybe low key a person of color and B is like seems to have a great life that isn't just obsessed with like undermining her stepdaughter. Yeah. Based on also the most interesting person in that whole movie. The oh, yeah. only person with any sort of common sense is Ursula. <laughs> common 
it's, a, it's about common sense. Well, it's, I mean, <laughs> have you watched that movie? Prince Eric is like just a dumb idiot. He's just <laughs> like a dumb, hot dumb. idiot, just a bag of rocks. And she's <laughs> yeah. like, I'm going to give up my whole life for this bag of rocks. I can't read. I can't write. <laughs> like she signs her name, but she can't write when she's with him ursula's like all these stupid people i'm taking advantage of like a real easy situation like give her her prop she's not a witch she's just a person with sense this is a businesswoman a businesswoman <laughs> well i think it's time to cast our spell so, right. as it has been i'll read again <laughs> with <laughs> <laughs> Withdraw your confirmation hex on ACB. <sighs> and and to uh, divine power. <laughs> Bless is be. I have an invisible Bless be. I'm, con I'm conjuring a drink. Oh. Oh. Thank you, Reverse Shotters, Chris Wisniewski, Jordan Cronk, Ryan Swin, James Wem, Justin Stewart, Nicholas Rapold, and Chloe Lazat for joining us in the audience. Oh. Hi, guys. Hey. Thank you everybody else for being here, joining us. The happy hour. Don't also, I'm going to plug it. Don't forget to see time. It's a great documentary. Yes. Beautiful Friday. documentary. Yeah. Produced by our Lauren Domino. Our very own Lauren Domino. Very. <laughs> Not about witches. And I'm a witch. <laughs> <laughs> Not about witches, but it is about, there's some female power happening for sure. There certainly is. Yeah. All right. See you all soon. Come back again.